the question about how ordinary Germans were mobilized is a very interesting question, too. It gets asked all the time. One of the reasons that question always comes up is because it's actually quite impossible to answer it. What's an ordinary German, right? Of course, Germans were not all in agreement. In fact, we know the highest percentage of popular vote the Nazi party ever received was under 40%. Under 40%. The Nazis never won a majority at the peak. So there were many people who had reservations about the Nazi movement for different aspects. Lots of Germans feared another war. For Hitler, war was not simply kind of an unavoidable or necessary evil. War was a goal because he understood you would not get expansion of Germany's living space without war and conquest. Many Germans who remembered the loss after World War I were not eager for another war and were quite nervous that, in fact, if Germany embarked on a rash foreign policy, it could mean a war that they would lose. However, with the initial successes, the rapid defeat of Poland in 1939, the fall of France in 1940, a lot of Germans were kind of won over. People say nothing succeeds like success, right? Nothing succeeds like success. And guess what helps? A little bit of plunder or a lot of plunder. So those soldiers were encouraged to grab up whatever they could and send it back home. You know, luxury clothing, fur coats, uh, perfume, fine wine, you know, and of course the government as a whole engaged in massive plunder, not just of Jewish property, of the property of all the conquered territories. So there's a kind of use of, you could say, everyday incentives that won a lot of people over. Let me give one concrete example. Most people are familiar with the events of Kristallnacht, November 1938, a massive pogrom attacking Jews in Germany. Well, by 1939, Germany was not just Germany. By then included Austria, annexed in 1938, and parts of what had been Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland. So in all those areas, attacks on Jews carried out by Nazi activists, often Hitler Youth or you know stormtroopers and so on. However, the Kristallnacht pogrom was also a big plunder operation. So again, a lot of people who might have had no problem with their Jewish neighbors, maybe they weren't particularly anti-Semitic, but suddenly they thought, wait a second, that window over there is broken. I could just go in there and grab what I want. Or on a bigger scale, my neighbors are desperate to move. They're going to sell their business at bargain basement prices. Why don't I grab that up? Or better yet, why don't I just go and take it? So you had people who might not have had a deep ideological commitment to anti-Semitism maybe before 1933, but they had more and more rewards for signing on to this way of thinking. And once they were implicated, of course, they didn't necessarily want to give up the positions or the properties or the benefits that they had gained from participating in the system. So you have, I would call it a kind of intersection the um, historian Ian Kershaw uses the phrase, I think very useful, working toward the Fuhrer. You know, Hitler's title, the Fuhrer. And by that, he actually got the phrase from a German bureaucrat who said, in this system, we don't need precise instructions from the powers at the top. If you know what you want, you can all be engaged in working toward the Fuhrer. So in other words, Hitler only needed to communicate in general terms. Attacks on Jews will be rewarded. People who move in the other direction will be punished. Um, aggressive measures um, against Poland or against people with disabilities, those will be allowed and encouraged, even rewarded. So once you have that dynamic in place, people would fall over themselves often to try to fulfill those expectations for their own benefit. So again, not everybody, but the people who didn't do so become in a certain sense sidelined. Um, and I think that dynamic of not brainwashed populations, there's some like hardcore 
Nazi believers, but the dynamic of the system comes from, or came from, you could say, that kind of everyday involvement of people who think, well, if my colleague gets thrown out of his job, maybe it means a better office for me, right? If uh, my neighbor, you know, has a, I don't know, if I owe my neighbor money from some work that, you know, he did for me, then suddenly my neighbor's gone. I don't have to pay back that debt. So you have those kind of everyday basic dynamics that you could say meld the interests of Hitler and the interests of so-called ordinary Germans.